So we're good to go? Yep. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, this is honestly a very uh, awesome surprise, and I'm uh, very honored to be doing this. Uh, I know this year has been a very, very interesting year for all you guys is trying to get into dental school because shadowing has been close to impossible uh, for most of you guys. And I think it's very awesome that something like this has been put together uh, because at the end of the day, we're all, I'm where many of you guys want to be. And I think it's really cool that um, we're utilizing technology to try to help you guys get to the point of getting into dental school, meeting those requirements that you guys need. But um, anyways, let's kind of uh, dive into it. Uh, so basically, who am I? Um, I am a general dentist. I have graduated from University of Detroit at Mercy uh, in 2019. So I've been practicing for 1.5 years, a year and a half in the Las Vegas area. I'm originally from California. And like I said, I went to dental school in Detroit. And because of circumstances, because of the things I wanted in my life, uh, it led me to Detroit. I mean, sorry, to Las Vegas. So the office I work in, it's a pretty big office. I actually work for a corporate office uh, called Pacific Dental Services. There are about 800 of these offices all throughout the country. And I work quite honestly in a top 10 office in the entire country for this company and probably a top 30 office in the entire country when it comes to both corporate from all the different companies and private practice combined. So we're a really, really big practice uh, producing a couple million dollars a year. We have five doctors, uh, four hygienists, over 10 assistants, and uh, I guess I was asked, what is my favorite procedure to do? Implant placement. I think it is awesome, easy to do, very quick to do. And uh, at the end of the day, you can really recreate someone's smile. And at the same time, it's a very high value procedure. Uh, so you can make a lot of money off of doing that as well. Uh, photo on the right over here. This was actually from Halloween this past year. Our office manager in the back, myself is Woody, and uh, our hygienist is Barbie. We did Toy Story. So <clears throat> my journey to becoming a general dentist. What happened, what did I do? Uh, so I went to undergrad at UCSD, uh, double major. So my pathway, little unique compared to most people because of the double major. Uh, so my GPA was a little bit lower. Uh, than most, I had a 3.2 and my science was about 3.5. Um, but at the same time, I took the DAT. And at this time, I don't know uh, for you guys what is considered a good DAT score anymore, but I know 21 at the time when I took it, it was very hard to get. Uh, that was, God, six, six and a half years ago, almost seven years ago when I took the DAT. So, uh, my best advice for you guys is really, really focus on your GPA. Very important at the end of the day. But the DAT is one of the most important things that you guys uh, can basically focus on as well. Because let's say you have a bad GPA, which was kind of my situation. This can completely uh, get you into dental school if you do well on it. At the same time, um, if you do poorly on it and you have a very good GPA, uh, it's not going to look too good it's basically gonna show that, hey, maybe this person went to an easy school. Maybe this person um, took very easy classes or had a very easy professor. So the, the DAT is important because it kind of levels the playing field. And at the same time, it can really uh, shift things in your favor if you do well on it. Um, I actually wanted to give a plug for a company uh, that I actually happen to go to dental school with uh, the creators of it. Um, I've seen them putting the whole thing together actually during the three, four years that they were putting it together at school. Uh, I believe it's actually the best thing that's out there right now. It's the most popular in Canada and they just moved it over about a year and a half ago to the United States. So definitely check it out. Uh, the DAT booster. Uh, at the same time, they have a very, very good uh, PAT uh, training 
type of deal, if that's what you want to call it. Um, coupon code right there. Uh, I had to do it. <clears throat> Another really important thing, volunteering. What do you do to separate yourself? Because on paper, that's the DAT and that's the GPA. Volunteering is something that really makes you shine and look different than everyone else because most people are going to be having the same type of things on paper as you. So what I did was um, I went to school at uh, UCSD where we run free dental clinic. So essentially me as a student, I was in charge of running it. I was uh, basically in charge of scheduling patients, uh, training assistants. The only thing I didn't do was a dentistry. We took x-rays and all that type of stuff. So it was a really cool experience. So see if you guys can get into something like that because at the end of the day, uh, most students are not doing anything like that. But at the same time, when it comes to volunteering, don't just do volunteering through dentistry. Do unique things. Uh, we had this department at school. I forget exactly what it was called, but it was to assess, to assist kids who, you were like a note taker for kids who had disabilities and couldn't come to class. Uh, I mean, things were very different then because we didn't really have like podcasting and Zoom lectures and things like that. Um, but that was a unique way to provide notes and to volunteer uh, for students who couldn't really go to class. And so try to find those types of things that you can do in terms of volunteering uh, that are very unique and sets you apart because it shows that, hey, look, this person's not just all about dentistry. They're truly a good human being who really just likes to help people because at the end of the day, that's part of the reason why we go into dentistry. At the same time, after I was done with school, I worked for Periodontist. Reason being is different experience. Um, you get to understand how a dental office actually works and it looks really good on your application. Uh, at the same time, I had jobs during, uh, during undergrad. Highly, highly suggest all of you guys to get some type of a job during, dental, uh, during undergrad because it will show that you're a well-balanced individual but at the same time, being a well-balanced individual who can handle their grades, their GPA, their DAT score, and do everything else on the, in their life looks very, very good. And at the same time, it shows that you can actually uh, be a responsible human being because uh, the working world is a lot different than the school world. And I don't really think most people realize that. But when you apply to school, um, those who are looking at your application, look at those types of things very favorably. If um, if you're actually on top of your grades. And uh, my story in terms of applications, I applied to 22 schools. I did 18 secondaries, and then I was invited for seven interviews. Ultimately, uh, only ended up going to three interviews, and I decided to choose Detroit Mercy. And by all means, guys, feel free to ask any questions that you guys have shoot them my way, I'd be more than happy to answer them during this entire thing. So what is general dentistry? I'm sure you guys already know. Um, you've heard this answer a million times. So here's a million and one. Um, basically, it's the part of the profession that lets you practice any type of dentistry, aside from those that um, unique oral surgery type of things where you're essentially doing jaw reconstruction surgery, cancer surgeries, things like that. But other than that, you can do anything you want to do because there are continuing education courses for that, that you can train yourself. And as long as you are competent and confident to do whatever it is that you're doing, by all means, you can do it. So that means implants, root canals, extractions, any type of tissue grafting, um, gum grafting, things like that bone grafting. Uh, also, at the same time, if you want to be somebody who opens up multiple offices, to be quite honest, you can't do that anymore uh, in any specialty. Only general dentistry, uh, because you are essentially home base, if that makes sense. You have all the other specialties working for you in your office. All the other specialties are kind of starting to shift away from having their own private practices because that's just the nature of how medicine is and how dentistry is. And anybody who tells you um, that's not the case, they're full. Um, but easiest to be, to be an owner is through general dentistry. And that's essentially what my goal is. <clears throat> 
So some advice for college, uh, for undergrad, like I said, maintain your grades, kick ass on DAT, be well-rounded. So make sure you volunteer, uh, make sure you network with people. And uh, like I said, volunteer as much as you can in a leadership position, that would be ideal. Uh, have a job and really, really important, network with faculty. And I actually have a very awesome video. I have a, a YouTube channel if you guys want to check that out. I think it still is like the most, has like the most views ever for um, like tips to, to, for like dental school interviews. So thousands, tens of thousands of people have like watched it, but I have some pretty unique ones. One in particular on letters of recommendations. I know this is a little different year uh, for many of you guys. So it, it, it's different in terms of how you can go about doing that. But in the future, the world will be back to normal. We will be back in class uh, talking to our teachers again. Uh, so I highly suggest you guys uh, watch some of those videos, particularly letter of recommendation, but kind of what, um, what I think is so important is because the letter of recommendation really shows the character of who you are. So a lot of students try to get a letter of rec from somebody who is very popular at school, who 200, 300 kids, excuse me, want a letter of recommendation from. Absolutely, that is the worst human being you can get a letter of rec from because they, unless you guys are literally like this, that's probably not the case. It's gonna be a very cut and paste letter of rec that's not going to show insight into who you are as an individual. If you find somebody uh, that is unique, maybe not that many people want a letter of rec from, but you make sure you go to their office hours, get to know them, talk to them as a human being, not just as somebody who, hey, I have a question on organic chemistry or whatever stupid bio class you have to take. Uh, get to know them as a person, and they're really going to be able to dive in and understand who you are and write a beautiful letter of recommendation. My interview at Detroit, actually, uh, one of the, the faculty brought it up to me and was like, we're really impressed with the letter of recommendation that was written by uh, about you. And so at the same time, that was a faculty that quite honestly, I like to just go and hang out with him a couple of times during the week, we would get lunch. I actually had dinner one time with him and his wife. Um, so it's, do those types of things because they really do separate you from, from your peers. <clears throat> so what is a typical day in general dentistry? Um, so when I say broken up in threes, essentially what it means is it's broken up into a treatment column. So I'm doing root canals, implants, crowns, fillings, whatever new patients, which is somebody brand new that comes into the office, take a full set of x-rays, or we focus on um, a chief complaint if they're in pain. And then we try to get them to start treatment that day. Uh, so that's the second column. The third column are six months, six month exams. Um, pretty much know what that is. Uh, and then ideally like to see a little bit between nine to 12 patients is a good day. Uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, kind of just depends on, on the day itself. So what kind of complaints do patients present with? Um, so when I say my population is very diverse, uh, it basically means I see a little bit of everything. I have rich YouTube stars coming in uh, who make millions of dollars a year, rich business people who make millions of dollars a year as well, middle class working family, kids from the poorest to the richest and everything else in between and patients who quite honestly can't really afford anything. Um, and so with that being the case, the wealthier the individuals are, the, the healthier they tend to be. So that tends to be a lot of cosmetic cases, teeth whitening, um, just regular hygiene care, things like that to people who come in with pain who need root canals or who need extractions and then an implant or people who need a full set of dentures. So we replace missing teeth. Lots of times uh, we have people coming in with weird things going on in their mouth where they have sores and bumps from herpes to oral cancer, unfortunately, uh, and everything else in between. And it's kind of our duty uh, to look inside the mouth and 
uh, assess what is it that's going on. But the amazing thing is if you don't know how to do something, if you're not too certain as to what's going on, you can always refer. And there's a specialty for everything. One of the big ones um, to really, really protect yourself is oral pathology. If uh, you see something that is a lesion that you don't know what it is, put a watch on it, say, look, we'll bring you back in two weeks, a month or whatever, see how that's going on. But at the same time, I want to refer you to our oral pathologist so they can take a look. At that point, it's up to them if they want to go and do that, but at least you protect yourself. So same thing, what kind of procedures do we do? A um, little bit of everything. You can honestly be taken out wisdom teeth, do implants, do root canals. At the end of the day, my best advice is to find your niche. Uh, Find whatever intrigues you, get really good at it, and have at least one of those things up your sleeve that you can stand toe to toe with anyone else and you know, I'm gonna be the best at doing root canals. I'm gonna be the best at doing implants because that's gonna separate you from your peers, but it's also gonna separate the practice that you work at uh, from your competitors because at the end of the day, it's all competition. So new technology and general dentistry, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, pretty rapidly changing. I'd say dentistry uh, changes a lot more quickly than medicine in terms of uh, things, how, how quickly things get implemented. So cone beam technology, CBCTs, those are unbelievable. I mean, we know what those are, uh, essentially CAT scans, uh, but now we're able to do that in the mouth. And so that's pretty cool because it allows us to create um, surgical guides, and understand the blood vessels, uh, the nerves, how they kind of go through an individual's jaw so we can place implants. Same time, we can see a lot of infections a lot more clearly that you may miss on an x-ray. And it's not because you're blind or something, it's just CBCT allows us to see right through anything. It's amazing. Uh, CAD CAM technology, I don't know if you guys know what that is, but that's essentially when you can uh, scan take photos of somebody's mouth and you can make a same day crown. The technology behind that is pretty old. It's been around since the early nineties, but it is changing so rapidly uh, that the things we can do, we can uh, basically take an image of somebody's mouth and we can make a denture that day. Not in my office, but that's something that we can do uh, if that's what your office really kind of specializes in doing. And then uh, I forgot to add on to this, but uh, my office is actually one of the pioneers of testing uh, oral DNA or saliva testing, which is really cool because it gives us an understanding of uh, the antibodies you have, the bacteria you have in your saliva. And at the end of the day, we know things are, are not what we were told 20 years ago. Everybody's body is very, very unique. Same thing like COVID. Some people get sick, other people, have absolutely no symptoms. And that's the same exact thing within the mouth. A lot of people have, excuse me, are more prone to periodontal disease, gum disease, um, or cavities as opposed to other people. And it's all because of the breakdown of what is in your saliva. A lot of it is actually contributed by diet. And uh, that's something that is pretty awesome because I think in the next uh, five years or so, there's going to be a big, big push with diet and dentistry because uh, at the end of the day, just like in medicine, we're finding out that that really dictates everything. And uh, diseases are entirely preventable. Sicknesses are almost entirely preventable if we just stay on top of our diet and we feed ourselves the way that we need to be fed. And dentistry is no different. Uh, so some important terms in general dentistry. Uh, crowns, fillings, root canals, oral pathology, implants, and refer. That's a really important one that I put over there because like I said, you can do anything you want in general dentistry. Uh, but at the end of the day, if uh, you don't know something, if you're unsure, refer. Let the patient know that I don't feel comfortable doing this or I don't know what's going on over here they will respect you a lot more as opposed to you thinking you know everything and fucking everything up. It happens a lot. 
All right, so now we're going into the cases. Let's see how we are with time, actually. Wow, pretty quick. So, good. <laughs> yeah, a uh, few questions my way if you guys have that. But uh, case number one. So, um, I'm just going to throw this out for you guys. What do you guys see? I can't really see if you guys uh, are chatting or anything like that, but this is actually a friend of mine. Big thing that you notice right away, this tooth right over here, right? And then this darkness right here. Essentially, that's just a giant infection um, for her. Unfortunately, we were not able to save this tooth or even the tooth up here. Can't quite see the infection up there from this image, uh, but both these two teeth had to be extracted. And now it comes down to what is it that we do um, after we extract the teeth? So big infections, you obviously put the patient on antibiotics, but you wanna remove as much of the infection as possible because that's going to complicate healing and it can make placing an implant in the future a lot more difficult. So for her, what I did, honestly, one of the toughest extractions of my life, uh, and it always happens to be on somebody you know. Took out that tooth and that tooth. We ended up packing bone over here after we took out the, the infection and same thing over there. So we can allow the area to heal up very nicely and to kind of integrate with itself uh, very nicely so we can place an implant about three to four months uh, afterwards. <clears throat> And uh, this was done about five months ago for her because this infection is so big. Uh, I kind of want to let it sit for a lot longer so we can fully allow the body to do what the body does and remove this infection. So for her, we're getting close to the point of placing implants and we will do that in a couple months, hopefully, whenever she's ready and able to kind of afford uh, what needs to be done. All right. case. By the way, if you guys have any questions about these cases, let me know. Case two, okay. This is a very unique one. Um, I don't know if you guys know what you're looking at, but essentially this is a pano radiograph. So one of the ones that wraps around a patient's head. Basically, this guy has no teeth. He's had no teeth. He's 55. He's had no teeth for, I want to say, close to 15, 20 years. And so with that, when you have no teeth, you have a lot of bone loss that starts to happen. And that's exactly the case on the bottom. You see how thin his ridge is right there and how thin his ridge is there. And even over here, we have absolutely no space uh, to place implants on the top. But his biggest complaint was his lower denture just does not sit anymore. And that's what happens when... Uh, you have a lot of bone loss. A lower denture is almost impossible. So that's why I always recommend to patients, I don't care if you can afford it or not, you should start considering to save money for implants, at least on the bottom, because if you're in your 50s, if you're in your 40s, we're gonna go to, to a pathway when we're 67 years old, you're not gonna have any bone left and you're gonna hate your life because you're not gonna be able to eat your food. You're not gonna be able to wear your denture. You're gonna have to drink your food through a straw. So for him, that was his situation. I looked at his bone, said, you know, maybe we can try to put two implants in here. So this was done back in late September, placed two implants, crossing my fingers, praying to God, hopefully they take. And about uh, three months from, from the initial date of placement, three to four months, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to check those implants, see if uh, they're integrated the way that I like them to be, if they are, he got lucky uh, because this is a case right here where he does not have a lot of bone. And I'm really kind of crossing my fingers to hope that it does take uh, to see if we can make some magic happen for the patient. And if that's the case, quality of life is gonna be vastly improved because we'll at least have a denture that snaps on on the bottom in one place. Ideally, you would like to have implants placed here, somewhere along here, kind of something like a table. You can get away with two. Ideally, you'd like them placed here or over here, but sometimes that's all you can really work with. And uh, we'll see what happens. <clears throat> all right, and so, like I said, you literally see 
everything coming into a dental office. So what happened with this lady? Um, this was, I want to say early October, late September as well. Uh, she was walking her dog one day. Um, dog kind of dragged her. She tripped, she fell, she hit her teeth on her, uh, on the curb actually. And just completely bent her teeth inwards. And, uh, she didn't know what the hell to do. Called her office, came in. I've never done anything like this before. Uh, our owner doctor was not there that day. And two of the other doctors there were also fairly young. We had a general idea of what needed to be done. Um, but luckily, uh, we were right. We ended up asking our orthodontist who happened to be working that day. And he's like, oh, e easy case. It looks like uh, her bone isn't broken. It's just bruised. So very, very malleable. And so what we did was we ended up having her bite on a popsicle stick for about five minutes or so to get her bite back to normal. And then we splintered her teeth for about a month and a half and uh, she's doing good now. At that time, uh, I told her, look, we're the first people that you're seeing, but I want you to go to the doctor as well uh, because there's a lot of damage that was done. I wanna see, did you have a concussion? Do you have a concussion? Did you break anything? Cause I can't quite see on the x-rays that I have. And so she went that day afterwards and it turns out she ended up actually breaking her nose um, so, but now she's doing a lot better. Um, a lot of scar tissue in certain areas. So my boss actually does Botox as well, which is something general dentists can do. Uh, he does Botox. So what we're going to do to kind of, uh, because this lip is a little bit more puffy than the left side of her lip, just naturally because of how the scar tissue is. And so what he's doing is just kind of adding a little bit of Botox lip filler to kind of plump up those lips. Uh, so it matches a little bit more and it doesn't look awkward. And um, so she'll be doing that uh, fairly shortly. But that <clears throat> is it for the cases. All right, advice to our future dentists. This actually, <clears throat> excuse me, this is actually my favorite quote. Men are not prisoners of fate, but rather prisoners of their own minds. It's an FDR quote. Um, some things are really, really kind of taken into consideration. Uh, work hard and play hard. You really want to balance life out. Life is not all about work. Life is not all about play. And if you teeter too much on one versus the other, uh, life is going to be very boring and very frustrating for you because uh, you're never going to enjoy life. You're never going to have fun if you work too hard. You're never going to enjoy the fruits of your labor. But if you play too hard, well, come time when you're old, uh, you're not going to be able to retire and relax and take it easy when your body hurts and you have all these sores and bruises from working as a dentist. Um, same thing, network as much as you can, uh, because at the end of the day, it's a very, very small profession. You never know who knows somebody that can hook you up with a job, get you an invite to a dental school interview. Uh, People will go above and beyond if you know them and if you build great relationships with them or will put you, excuse me, into contact with others who can possibly do that and uh, never stop learning, obviously in the profession that you're in, but continue to read and read things that are not dentistry because the day your formal education is over, meaning undergrad, or if you go into a graduate program, whether it's dentistry, pharmacy, or business, whatever, we are never really forced to learn anything ever again. And that's sad because we are meant to be lifelong learners. And like I said, don't just focus on the things that are in your profession. Focus on unique things um, like finance, business, taxes, things like that, that you absolutely have to know as an individual because these are things we don't learn in school. And there will come a time when you wish you knew that. And you don't want that time to be when you're 45, when you're 50, when you really are getting close to retirement. You wanna be prepared early on and have an understanding of when I'm working, how do I hit the ground running so I can save for my future? Because lo and behold, you never know what happens. You might get cancer, 
You might break something that allows you not to work anymore. You may be forced to retire early for some reason. And if, if you take the, the right steps as soon as you can, it's not going to be as burdensome if those things do happen. All right, guys. So this is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, my Instagram right over here at Pat the Dentist. Make sure to give me a follow. Uh, and like I said, I have a YouTube channel that really dives into a lot of things that I think are going to be interesting uh, to help you guys uh, with your applications how to handle those dental school interviews. And uh, by all means, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, a DM on Instagram. I'd be more than happy to answer any type of questions uh, that you guys have. Uh, and right now, if you guys have any questions, I would love to answer them, but I don't know how to see them. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Angel. I'll read out some questions to you that we have. So awesome. the first question is about um, secondaries, like the secondary applications. Some people weren't unsure of what that means. What is okay, so you have an initial application. Every school has that, right? It's on access uh, and you just send that out on a mass to whatever schools that you want to apply to. I think only the, at least when I was doing it, I think only the Texas schools have like their very, own unique application uh, because Texas just does it better, honestly. Um, and so, but secondaries, almost every school has a secondary and secondaries themselves typically are just you paying a fee to the school, school because schools are money hungry. That's what they are. You guys will see that when you go to school. It's unfortunate. Um, it's typically a fee or you have to write uh, some type of a, answer to a unique question they give you or an essay to something, you know, uh, it can be anything like that. Uh, some schools have you require you to send a photo in with an, uh, with, uh, an application fee, but I think every single school has some sort of an application fee. So that's why I'm saying it gets pretty expensive because like me, I applied to 22 schools, 18 secondaries, um, and 22 schools, I forget exactly what that ended up being, but then 18 secondaries when they average between like 50 to $100 uh, per application, that adds up as well. That's easily over another $1,000 that you may not have even budgeted for. And so I think you guys should because you only want to apply to dental schools once. So cast as wide of a net as you possibly can so you don't have to apply again because the best school to go to is the one that accepts you. Many of you guys might say, hey, look, I really want to stay in state, but you don't get in this year, but you get in somewhere else. You need to go to that other school. Stop wasting time because you got to look at what is the opportunity cost that you just basically foregone. You now are not going to school for an extra year. So that's a one year less of extra earning. So essentially, you can consider that to be uh, between one hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars. As at, at the end of the day, that goes into your bank account. So one less year. At the same time, dental school tuition is raising every single year. So whatever the cost of school is this year, expect it to be a little bit higher the next year. So um, yeah. Thank you. So we have another question. <laughs> Um, what type of job would you recommend to get during undergrad, like dental assisting, things like that? Um, so I definitely do dental assisting if you can, uh, if you can find a paid position. I did that for, like I said, 10 months. I was a paid dental assistant. Uh, but before that, uh, I worked at Pizza Hut one summer. Um, I worked at the bookstore at, at my school for close to two years. I did that. Uh, towards the end of it, I opened, I started my own tutoring company and kind of connected uh, people who wanted to tutor to people who wanted to get tutored. Uh, so just kind of unique things that allowed me to make some money, but at the same time, stuff that you can put down on your application that shows you know how to have, uh, how to balance things, how to be responsible. Uh, so I would say something that is, tends to have a more flexible schedule. So you can kind of work around your class schedule. I know typically if you work on campus, 
they tend to do that for you. They tend to kind of work around your final schedule and all your classes. And so lots of times at the same time, um, working for a dental office, they tend to understand, look, so-and-so is trying to get into dental school. I have to kind of work around their, their work schedule, uh, their school schedule. So uh, something like that. But anything looks good on your application, but a dental job looks the best. What is your advice for people who are scared of going to dental school because of how expensive it is? I don't know. Don't do it then. I mean, uh, you're going into a profession where you're making a lot of money, right? But uh, if you go into anything with the fear of how expensive the schooling is going to be, um, that is probably not the right mentality you should be having because at the end of the day, Yes, dental school is very, very expensive and it's only getting more expensive. But any profession you go into, any schooling for that profession is an investment in itself. So you have to understand there are two different types of, of, of loans that you can get. One that I consider essentially an investment, which can be a house, uh, your education, and then there are just trash investments, trash loans that you get uh, for stuff that you shouldn't be buying, a car that you probably shouldn't have at this point in time, or things that like a brand new TV or whatever, credit card debt, things like that. So there are two types of debt and you need to look at it in the sense of I'm going into a profession where I'm making a lot of money. Um, but at the same time, if this is truly what you love, you shouldn't be fearful of what the cost is going to be at the end of the day. And that's the same thing I kind of said earlier. Um, when you have to be reading finance books, you have to be learning about how money works, how to grow your wealth. Very, very important because if you have an understanding, and this isn't just for dentistry, this is for everyone on this planet. Read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, first of all. Amazing book. I highly recommend every individual to read. I think it's the best book that's been ever written. But first of all, it needs to be something that everybody looks into, not just high net worth individuals or people who are going into a profession that makes a lot of money, but especially for those individuals, because now you have a massive amount of debt where you're making a ton of money at the same time. What do you do with that money to pay off that debt? At the same time, how do you grow that money so 10 years down the road, you look back and you're like, wow, I have two, $3 million that is just kind of sitting here in my investment accounts or in my savings, well, not savings, but investment accounts, things like that. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about it. I think you just need to be prepared uh, for what's coming. And if you're prepared, you're not going to be afraid. Sounds good. There's somebody in the chat who is a current undergrad student and works part-time as a dental assistant. Do you think that their work experience could count towards shadowing? Um, yes and no. I remember actually this being a thing for a couple schools where you could actually double dip. Um, I don't know if every school allows that to happen. Maybe now it does because of the weird world we're living in, but you definitely have to ask the school and definitely reach out to, um, uh, sorry, I'm so glad this question actually came up. Uh, reach out to schools, to their administration's department. Ask them those types of questions because they'll be more than how, that is their goal. That is their job title. These people get like $50,000 a year to ask, to answer these types of questions for you guys. So utilize it. But at the same time, set up uh, tours of dental schools. Let them know, hey, look, can I come and take a tour of the school? I want to see. Um, I'm considering the school. I think it's awesome. Uh, some BS like that. Set up a tour and go there. Network with the students there. Network with the faculty there if you can. And make your, yourself a presence there. That person who continuously just kind of shows up one two, three times a year or something like that, they kind of remember you, trust me. Uh, there's that pre-dental student that's always here and faculty like that because it means you show an interest in the program and what they're kind of all about. Thank you. What happens when someone doesn't have enough bone for dentures or implants? 
Um, well, like in that guy's situation, there is obviously a way to go about it, <clears throat> uh, but it is fifty to eighty thousand dollars worth of surgery, where you have to take bone from like his hip or something like that. And then you can actually put it in on the lower mandible um, or you can do implants that are honestly two, three inches long that kind of cross like that into somebody's zygomatic process, um, which is very possible to do. And a lot of people do it. But like I said, that averages between 50 to like $100,000 sometimes. Uh, and so most people can't afford that type of stuff. Um, so yes, you can do it, but if not, uh, you really advise the patients, uh, whenever they get an extraction, I let them know <clears throat> we want to go ahead and we want to place the bone graft material in that site so we can allow the area to heal up nicely. So we have enough bone to place an implant in the future and patients say, well, what, why do I want an implant? I don't, I don't need an implant or something like that. I'm like, well, look, it's not so much just about replacing that tooth. It's about maintaining harmony in the rest of the mouth. You have a certain bite force when you have, when you bite down and that gets distributed over however many teeth you have in the mouth, 28 teeth, let's say that, right? Now you are missing a tooth. That bite force doesn't really change at all, but now that force gets distributed on a lesser number of teeth. So basic physics, those teeth are taking a lot more brunt. So it accelerates their wear and tear. And especially if you have uh, fillings, crowns or any other work. And I always tell my patients, look, you spent thousands of dollars on all this other stuff. It will break down a lot faster. And we wanna go ahead and we wanna prevent that. And we wanna protect the investment that you made so many years ago and pay Patients, typically at that point, I don't really have patients say, oh, okay, like I don't want this anymore. They understand the necessity. And I think the big thing in dentistry, which is a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you, you look at it, uh, is very different than medicine in the sense that we're salespeople. We are, whether you want to believe it or not, you're a salesperson. You have to convince somebody uh, to basically accept treatment for something that they may not necessarily know that they need, especially if they're not feeling pain. When they're feeling pain, they're like, all right, sure, let's do it. I, I trust everything you're saying because they're in pain. But when they're not in pain, you really have to be able to explain in layman's terms to somebody why it is that they need a root canal, even though it's not hurting them. Why is it that they need an implant or an extraction or something like that, right? And that's what I like to kind of say is, is dentistry is kind of selling the invisible at a certain point in time. But if you can create these metaphors for patients <clears throat> and you're genuinely concerned about their, their concerns, then uh, patients are going to love you and they're going to move forward with treatment. You seem to really enjoy implants. Did you ever consider a perio residency? Hell no. Honestly, perio is dead. That is my opinion. I don't think it's going to be around. I mean, it's going to be around, but it is just narrowing so much because in the past, periodontists are all about supporting your bone, which is great, awesome, cool. I'm all for it. But at the same time, we can do a lot of that maintenance in the office. There's a lot of over-diagnosing uh, for patients that need osteosurgery or some type of very in-depth uh, periosurgery to preserve their bone, when in reality, they may not necessarily need that. So that is kind of starting to go away. Implants as well. The den most dentists that I know that are quote unquote implantologists are not periodontists. They are just a general dentist who can place any implant better than any periodontist. Those are the experts, to be quite honest, not even an oral surgeon or, or something like that. Those are the ones who really just focus and wanted to be the best. Um, and so now that so many general dentists are placing implants because it's very easy to do, it's very cheap to do, it's very quick to do, and you make a lot of money doing it, dentists are like, yeah, let's do it. General dentists are like, let's do it. So they're not referring anymore as often as they were. So now that pool is starting 
to kind of trickle, you know? So now you're doing these very unique surgeries, gum grafting, tissue grafting, which in all honesty is a rich person procedure. It's cosmetic dentistry on steroids. Um, you have more people coming in wanting uh, <clears throat> brand new teeth with crowns who are not making as much money as opposed to somebody who wants tissue grafting. Very, very unique uh, type of thing. Very few individuals actually need it. Um, and it's very expensive to do. Um, so it's a lot of tissue management. And then you're doing sinus lifts and things like that. And honestly, a lot of dentists are kind of starting to do that. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Mark Costas is, uh, but he has this amazing podcast called Dentalpreneur Podcast. Um, and he's talking about a lot of courses that general dentists are taking to do sinus lifts, which allow you to place implants. But it's not so much just that. There are implants that are actually coming out. They um, are out right now. Uh, one in particular is called Versa. And uh, you can actually do a sinus lift while you're placing the implant. So there you go. Like another reason why you don't need a periodontist when these types of things exist. And if I want to add bone to, um, uh, to a ridge or something like that, to place an implant or a denture or something like that, those periodontists that do it, they've been doing it for a long time and they are good at what they do. So they've established themselves 15, 10, 20 years ago where everybody's referring to them. But as a new periodontist, I don't know. I don't really consider people to, um, to go into that profession. Do it if you want to do it. But I think there are better specialties that will be around a lot longer. Um, and they're kind of protected because nobody wants to do root canals, right? Like a lot of dentists do love doing them, but vast majority of dentists are not like stealing away patients from, from anodontists and oral surgeons, same thing. Like, um, and pediatric dentists, a lot of people, they don't want to see kids. So those are kind of protected, but perio, eh, I don't know. I mean, it's up to you, but I don't advise it. How do you think COVID will permanently change dentistry? Um, I think, I think we're going to go back to normal very, very soon. I think a lot of places are normal. Uh, it's just, let's be real. The virus is not as bad as we are told it is. Uh, the data is out there. Whether you want to believe it or not, you don't have to, but the data shows it. Uh, it's a lot of misinformation at the same time all over the news. Uh, and you guys got to be very understanding of that, that um, then how the news cycles run is based off of fear mongering. You can look into how uh, six, 60 minutes back in like the 70s and 60s and 70s kind of started this whole sensationalized and dramatized uh, news cycles because people are more willing to listen to news when the stories are ridiculous, right? Um, and so we as dentists believe less than 1% of, of dentists have tested positive for COVID. Um, and so we are the lowest transmission rate, I guess, if, if you want to say of COVID in the entire country of any profession, uh, we've always been the lowest when it comes to any type of virus, any type of bacteria. Uh, and the thing is, we didn't really have to change protocols at all, other than you wear now N95 masks, but we didn't have to change protocols in terms of how we break down our rooms, how we wipe everything down and clean things. Because if we did, that means we were not doing a good job to begin with. So I think the profession's been very good in that regard, but patients quite honestly are very fed up as well. They're tired of COVID. Uh, a lot of them don't, don't care for it anymore. And they're like, look, I want to come in. I want to get my cleaning. I have my teeth hurt. I want to get this done. I need implants. I need dentures. Uh, so I think patients are a very big driving force. Uh, the ADA actually, <clears throat> I think it was two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, released a study that basically kind of broke down, uh, dental offices and COVID and patient experiences. And now uh, they said, what is the biggest thing, the, the biggest concern of, of patients' minds? Uh, is it still COVID? Is it the virus itself? I think 12% said yes, but like 80% of the population said the economy is the biggest thing that's on their mind. So you can see a lot of people are over it. And now with the vaccine coming out, whether you believe people should take it or not, that's that's aside from the point, but um, 
with the vaccine, a lot of people are now being put at ease. I mean, the Trump administration said about 20 million uh, doses will be uh, basically distributed this December. And now it's kind of looking like somewhere close to 40 million doses. And it's going to be put to high risk individuals in certain areas, uh, essentially meaning healthcare workers. And so with the rollout of the vaccine, um, people are going to just go back to normal, like it never happened. And uh, I think these next couple couple months uh, could be a make or break type of thing. But once this, the vaccines are out and people really kind of chill the hell out a bit, I think we're going to be hitting our stride and uh, uh, we could have a very good couple years in the future or very bad couple years in the future. Um, we'll see to be determined with policies. Yep, I agree. Um, how, how do you recommend getting in touch with professors now during this time where everything's online? How can we send them an email, honestly, just send them an email or see if they do something like, um, I don't know, like a zoom office hours or zoom dinner and learn or something like that. And ask them, Hey, would you be willing? I think this is a great idea. Would you be willing to, uh, have like a dinner and a zoom dinner and learn with me and like nine other people. And we just kind of talk about something in the class and we talk about, um, I don't know, random stuff that's going on in our lives. And we can just do it for 45 minutes or an hour or something like that. I think that's unique. And then once the world kind of starts opening back up, uh, you, you'll see, you'll be able to kind of go back to some of those, those old things. But I think unique things like that, uh, really can kind of separate you guys. What are your thoughts on pediatric dentistry? Um, love or hate, like you really got to be all about children if you want to go into that very, very lucrative profession, make a ton of money doing it, um, but you can't be half-ass about it. Uh, I enjoy seeing kids from time to time. Uh, they're refreshing because they're little clowns, they say funny things, and you can have a stressful day, and just a child walks in sometimes, and they do something ridiculously funny, uh, and it just kind of lightens up your day. I enjoy that, but I don't want that to be the bulk of my day, because lots of times you deal with the very, very frustrating and annoying kids, because uh, that's who you refer to the pediatric dentist, is that kid who can't sit still, that kid who needs to be sedated, or whatever. Um, those are the ones that get referred. So you really, really got to enjoy that. But at the same time, um, if you're considering specialties when you're in dental school, keep all doors open. And what I mean by that is network and maintain good grades. Because if you maintain good grades, you can apply to any specialty that you want. You'll have a better understanding. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. When people have are not in dental school, they're pre-dental students and they're like, I'm going to be an oral surgeon. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. I'm like, you know what? No, you're not. Because the odds are you're probably going to switch your, your, your mind when you're in school, because now you're actually exposed to what that unique specialty is. And I know so many people who came into school with that exact same mentality. And it just completely flipped when they realized, look, I don't want to do this. I don't want to study this hard to, to get those grades. Um, and, and so you kind of have to you kind of just got to be open to all things. Don't, don't close the doors unless you're hundred percent certain you just want to be a GP. And, uh, and yeah. What should a dental student focus on learning during SIM clinic? Alternatively, what aspects of SIM clinic should a student not spend so much time on? Oh man, SIM lab. Uh, understand that that's not real dentistry. And, um, you're going to have a lot of people who do really, really well in sim lab, but they absolutely suck as dentists. Um, so don't put too much weight on it. Obviously, it's very important in terms of grades and all that stuff, but don't put too much weight on it in the sense that because I'm good at this, I'm going to be a good dentist. That's not the case. Really understand the basics and the principles of whatever it is that you're doing in sim clinic. So you can apply those things to treating actual patients. I think that is the most important thing when it comes to sim clinic. 
understand the basics, understand uh, the dimensions of every little thing that you're doing. So you can apply that because in the mouth, everything is 100% different. You will probably never or very rarely do an ideal prep or whatever they want you to do in sim clinic because decay is very, very different in the mouth. So uh, it's just good to have an understanding. And at the same time, network with the faculty there. Shoot the shit with them. I'm telling you, most of them are old, have very interesting lives that they've lived, and uh, have very unique things that they can talk to you about and a lot of hilarious stories. And you want to get to know them, befriend them, because they're going to make your life that much easier in school. And at the same time, um, they can connect you to somebody who might possibly uh, help you get a job or go into a residency program or whatever it is that you want to do. <clears throat> How can we become a dental assistant or get x-ray certified? Um, that really kind of depends on the state that you live in. Uh, because I grew up in California. They let you be an x-ray tech if you just went and took x-ray courses. Uh, same thing. Some states required you to be a registered dental assistant or certified dental assistant. Uh, so it kind of just depends. And if you just do a quick Google search, or if you have a dentist, just ask them, um, how can I become one? Uh, I'm curious what the, the state laws are. They technically should know the state laws because they're employing people. Uh, so, so yeah, somebody like that will be better able to answer because every state is different. How do you recommend getting good um, recommendation letters? What are some tips? Okay, so uh, first things first, go to office hours. <clears throat> Do those types of things that I mentioned. Office hours are crucial. Ask them about whatever question you have in the class. Get to know them as an individual at the same time. Go regularly. Go every week. Get to know the, the faculty. Ask them. Uh, I know lots of schools do this, like a dining with the professor or some lunch with the professor thing definitely invite them to something like that if that's a thing or ask them look hey let me buy you lunch one day um what's five dollars in the grand scheme of things go go eat somewhere with them and just pick their brain get to know them as an individual now you're in the door when it comes to asking for the letter of rec a lot of people would say oh this is a very kiss-ass thing to do every single for the last like almost two years of my school every single professor that I, I had that I liked as an individual, um, whether it was an econ professor or a bio professor, wasn't even just somebody that I wanted to get a letter of rec from. I wrote them a thank you card and I gave them that at the end of the year or um, like on the last day of the finals, um, or I gave them, slid it under their door or something like that in their office. Uh, but basically think about it for yourself. Like how far does a thank you know actually go and be genuine about it why you're thanking them <laughs> little things that stick out about them as a as a professor or something because think about it yourself if this were to happen to you somebody gives you a thank you note and they're truly appreciative of the work you put in to help them achieve whatever it is that they needed to achieve uh and faculty are no different they want they love to be recognized and most people don't do that and they will forever remember your name and I would always put my email address um, at the very bottom of it as well. And I'm telling you, every single time faculty would email me and be like, thank you. This means so much. Like, I really, I really enjoy the fact that you uh, sent me this and gave me this because most people don't do that. It only takes five minutes to write. And I did the same thing in dental school as well. Uh, every faculty member afterwards, even if I hated them, which a lot of them I did. Uh, I still gave them a thank you card. And at the end of the day, you guys may butt heads or whatever, but there's a mutual respect that you guys have amongst each other. And they'll forever remember that. So we only have time for one more question. Okay. Um, did you participate in research during undergrad? Um, yeah, kind of. Um, mine was like on, it was through econ. It was very different. It wasn't bio related. So I'd like put it down, but it wasn't something that like dental schools would be like, oh my God, this is, 
this is like research for medical school or pharmacy school or something like that. Uh, it was like oil related and oil companies and like offshore drilling type of stuff. So I'm going to say, no, I didn't, not in healthcare, not in science, which I don't think you need to do. I don't think anybody needs to do that unless you really want to, which is great. A lot of people do that, but I know so many people who graduated from school and never having done research. You need to find your niche. Yes. Thank you for your time, doctor. We really appreciate it. Of course, no problem. It, it's an honor being invited to do this. Uh, I hope you guys, I hope I really answered a lot of questions and kind of helped shed some light on, on what dentistry is. If you guys had a couple questions about it, but like I said, feel free to hit me up on Instagram, uh, YouTube, definitely check out that DAT thing. And I'd be more than happy, DAT booster. And I'd be more than happy to uh, answer any questions you guys have. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Angel, for your time today and for preparing this slideshow. It was really informative. Um, thank you all to everyone watching uh, tonight. Uh, make sure you guys uh, fill out the quiz. You can either, either find it in the YouTube um, live chat or the link tree in our uh, Instagram bio as well. Um, and make sure you guys join us for our next session, which is going to be Friday, December 4th at 11 a.m. EST. So thank you again, Dr. Angel. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, guys. <laughs> all right. You. you guys take care. All right.